welcome everyone for the conference. At the outset, I would like to thank Dr. Kamini Rao and all the organizers for inviting me for this conference. It's a great pleasure and honor to be here. So the title of my talk today is Human Oocyte Vitrification, Where Are We Today? So as we know, there are many, many reasons why all of us, all the laboratories today need to learn how to freeze oocytes well. Reasons such as, first and foremost, fertility preservation for cancer patients. Okay. Fertility preservation for cancer patients. Now, as all of us know, the cancer treatments have improved tremendously today, and almost one in every four or five cancer patients survives. Now, this is a tremendous new hope for the cancer patients, and this new hope is raising new concerns, concerns about their fertility. And we as fertility physicians and scientists must ensure that we preserve the fertility of these young girls and women as they are cured of their disease and so that they can lead a normal life. So for fertility preservation of these patients, we have oocyte crab preservation if they are not married, embryo crab preservation if they have a spouse, and ovarian cortex vitrification. Then another very important reason to learn to freeze oocytes is to build donor oocyte banks. If we can learn to freeze oocytes and if we can learn to use frozen oocytes, then the management of our egg donation programs becomes extremely easy and simplified. Then there are, of course, legal and ethical limitations in many countries that do not allow embryo cryopreservation preservation and oocyte vitrification is absolutely indispensable for them. We have now accumulation of oocytes as a new strategy to treat poor responders. And finally, last but not the least, a very important reason to learn to freeze oocytes very well is what is termed as elective egg preservation or social egg freezing. Now, as we know, ovarian reserve depletes really, really fast for women. By the time the woman reaches about 35 years of age, her ovarian reserve is reaching dangerously low levels. And as we know from our IVF practice, the chances of conceiving really lessens after, the year, after 35 or 38 years of age. And this reduction in number of eggs is also associated with a reduction in the quality of eggs. As we know from increased miscarriage rates, increased chromosomal abnormalities and aneuploidies in older women. So unfortunately, women are left with only about 15 years within which they can reproduce. And these 15 years coincide exactly with the time frame which is crucial for their higher education pursuit or their career development. So I feel that we must use this available technology to offer some flexibility to women as far as their reproductive options are concerned. And this is now becoming a real reality. This is a paper by Anna Kobo in 2016, a very recent survey, where she has shown that almost 94.2% of people who, were, who froze their eggs, apart from uh, the medical reasons, 94.2% of them did it for age-related reason or social egg freezing. So with so many reasons to freeze oocytes, why has it taken us so long to freeze oocytes efficiently? We have been freezing embryos since last 25 years, but it's only now that we are talking about oocyte vitrification. Well, it is because the oocyte is a very special cell. First and foremost, the sheer size of the oocyte. It is the largest cell in the human body, and this increases the challenge in successful crab preservation. The almost spherical shape of the oocyte makes equal permeation of the cryoprotectants extremely difficult and again increasing the challenge in successful cryopreservation. The least possible cell number, one, again makes freezing the oocyte extremely difficult. Multicellular embryos can survive even after losing one or two cells, but the oocyte has no backup. It has absolutely no backup to recover from any kind of injuries. Then we have zona pellucida hardening, we have impact on the oocyte physiology, the meiotic spindle. So all these things have made freezing the oocyte somewhat like a very complicated hurdle race, and we have to take a very, very careful approach to come out of this race as winners. 
Now, historically, if we see, the first reported live birth from a frozen egg was reported by Chen in 1986. But there were tremendous difficulties and delays in reliably repli replicating Chen's success. And oocyte crop preservation was con considered to be a low chance option for fertility preservation. And in fact, the early estimates suggested that almost 100 eggs were needed to give one live birth. So very rightly so, till very recently, till 2013 in fact, the ASRM had considered oocyte crop preservation as experimental. But now, Everything has changed. Now we have improved survival with oocyte crop preservation. And how, this is, how has this happened? This has happened because of a wonderful technique called vitrification. As we all know, vitrification is a process of converting aqueous solutions into the glassy or amorphous state on cooling, escaping freezing. The formation of ice is prevented by very rapid cooling rates and the introduction of some agents that suppress the formation of ice, what we call as cryoprotectants. So vitrification has really been the game changer here, not just for oocyte vitrification, but also actually the way we practice ART today because of so many different applications of embryo cryopreservation as well. So, ASRM considered, uh, declared oocyte vitrification as no longer experimental in 2013. And how did this change come? This change is based on a lot of evidence in literature, evidence starting from 2008 onwards. And as you can see, many of these evidences are randomized controlled trials. Randomized controlled trials means a very, very high level of medical evidence. Now, ICSI was introduced without any randomized control trials. Embryo crop preservation was introduced into clinical practice without any randomized control trials. But we have had now so many randomized control trials, so many studies for oocyte vitrification, and we must look at all this data, and it is all these data that has made ASRM change its mind. So what is the goal? When we freeze an oocyte, what is our goal? Our goal is to cryopreserve this cell very, very safely without any damage to its further developmental potential till the patient's dream of achieving a baby comes true. This is our ultimate goal in cryopreserving an oocyte or an embryo. And how do we achieve this goal? We have to use an established protocol to achieve this goal. And that brings us to the question, what is an established protocol? Now for any technique to be called a clinically approved technique to be established in routine clinical practice, it must be reliable, which means that we must get consistently, repeatedly very high survival rates as far as cryopreservation is concerned. It must be universal, means constant high survival rates must be achieved by all laboratories, not just few. The protocol has to be universally good. Now, traditionally, slow freezing was used for cryopreservation. Slow freezing worked well in certain laboratories in certain hands. By and large, universally, people did not ex uh, accept slow freezing as a very reliable technique. So it was not a universal method. But vitrification has been reliable, it is universal, and it is a very safe method. Now let us look at certain principal steps in vitrification. The first step is to add the cryoprotectant. Then we cool the cells to minus 196 degrees centigrade. Then we warm the cells and finally remove the cryoprotectants from the cells. And there are many, many factors that affect successful vitrification during these processes. These factors are cryoprotectants, cooling rates, warming rates, type of carrier device used, temperature of vitrification solution at exposure, duration of exposure to the cryoprotectant, volume of the vitrification solution, and finally, experience of the operator and the protocol that is used. Now, vitrification, as we know, is to obtain an amorphous state without ice crystal formation. 
if we have even 3% of intracellular water converting into ice, we can have cell death. Now, if we see ice crystals growing under a microscope, we can see that there is uh, these crystals are uh, cutting into the cell organelles and damaging the cell organelles. So it is very important to avoid these ice crystals. Now, if we see in mathematical terms, the probability of vitrification increases if we can increase the cooling and warming rate and decrease the volume. This was the most successful strategy that was applied for vitrification. Cryoprotectants. Now, the initial first decade of research was based on the development of the cryoprotectants. We have penetrating cryoprotectants and non-penetrating cryoprotectants. Penetrating cryoprotectants protect the cells from penetrating the tissue, and they replace some of the water that they contain. And ethylene glycol, DMSO, are the most commonly used penetrating cryoprotectant. And we have non-penetrating cryoprotectant like sucrose and trehalose. Now, the almost double or triple amount of cryoprotectant that was used for vitrification was shocking, and hence a lot of research went into developing mixtures of cryoprotectants. And it was found that if we have, if we use mixture of two or three cryoprotectants instead of a single cryoprotectant, then it is much better as the toxicity of each can be lower than when each is used singly. Then macromolecules like sucrose and trehalose were added again to reduce the toxicity of the cryoprotectant and to preserve the cells from osmotic shock. Now, there are many, many practical tips while using the high concentration of cryoprotectants. And we are going to, there is no time to go through all this just now. And we'll, we have a live demonstration during which we'll be getting into all these small, small tips on how to achieve almost 100% survival with vitrification. So all these steps I'll be describing in detail during the demonstration. Now, as we know, there are two main systems of vitrification. There is open system and there is closed system. Open system vitrification, there is direct contact of oocytes or embryos with liquid nitrogen. And in closed system, this is avoided. There is no direct contact of the cells with liquid nitrogen. There are a lot of issue, uh, concerns about safety of open systems. And there is possible risk of contamination through the use of open system. However, we have to think, is this risk really applicable to real IVF situation? The estimated over 500 transfers after the use of open vitrification system have not resulted in a single detected infection. That is, the probability seems to be less than 0.0002%. And as far as effectiveness of both the methods are concerned, there are few studies about closed system vitrification, and the best survival rates reported in, in these studies were between 70 and 85%. Whereas with open system, survival of 98% or above was reported after oocyte vitrification. Now, this was a very, very elegant review published by Gebor Vashta in 2015. And he has concluded, and I quote, that overwhelming evidence shows that open systems are efficient for both blastocyst and oocyte vitrification. Relevant data on closed systems are sporadic, especially in the case of human oocytes, and are far from convincing. A pragmatic approach in both legislation and scientific evaluation is suggested. In other words, consider the facts instead of theories and acknowledge the value of methods that are used in thousands of clinics and that have helped many infertile couples. Now, there is this time schedule for vitrification when we are doing oocyte vitrification. The time schedule is very, very important when to freeze the oocyte, how much to wait after thawing. And again, we'll be going through this in detail during the demonstration. Vitrification is highly skill dependent and stringent adherence to the protocol cannot be overemphasized. 
these protocols are developed by scientists with years and years of research in the field. They have been researching in the field for last two or three decades, and finally they've developed these protocols. They've come up with the protocols, the volumes, the temperature, everything with a lot of research. And if Excuse we me, want to achieve results that are reported in literature, we must try and follow whatever protocol that is recommended by the manufacturer. The yeah. So finally, I would just very briefly like to share our results of oocyte vitrification. These are donor uh, oocytes. These are frozen donor oocytes. So there is, this is a laboratory comparison of fresh oocytes versus vitrified and warmed oocytes. And I was really, really happy to note that there was no difference between the fertilization rate, cleavage rate, and good grade embryo rates. Uh, between the fresh oocytes as well as vitrified warmed oocytes. These are all donor oocytes from young patients under the age of 30. And, but this is just one part of the story. The fact that the oocytes behave very well in the laboratory is not complete. What we want is a baby for our patients from these frozen oocytes. So let us look at the clinical results. Again, these are the same donor oocytes. So it's a group of patients where we are expecting high pregnancy rates. And the pregnancy rates between fresh oocytes and the vitrified warmed oocytes, there was again no difference. Pregnancy rate, implantation rate, biochemical pregnancy rate, absolutely no difference. So now we have a technology. Today we have a technology where you, we can use frozen oocytes. So it, is, it makes the management of the egg donation program extremely easy. And I think it's a very, very good thing and we must avail of this technology. Then we have another strategy, many, many papers now coming up as accumulation of oocytes, a new strategy for managing low responder patients, especially in countries where embryo cryopreservation is not allowed. So oocyte vitrification for now, open system seems to be winning and it looks like it gives us better result. Always remove the cumulus from mature oocyte before freezing. Freeze within two hours of retrieval and wait for three hours after thawing. So finally, current crab reservation programs for oocytes are providing successful outcomes, allowing the practice of variety of new strategies in IVF. And it is very difficult actually to kill human oocytes now by using the right established vitrification protocol. If the protocol is used correctly, we are going to get 100% survival rate. And it is our duty as reproductive scientists to follow these protocols very, very well and keep the human life safe, keep the precious oocytes safe with us. Thank you.